Today we're going to talk about these issues. We started talking last at the end of last class, well, during last class, about the social context of the classroom and the concept of socialization. I'm going to write on the board briefly. They need to. The home screen looks pretty. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. So, we started talking about socialization. Anybody recall what we discussed and what we said socialization definition, a basic definition is? Don't all... Well, I'm not going to tell you. So, until you come up with something, I can say it. What is the definition, a definition, of socialization? Oh, but you don't need this class to tell me a definition of socialization. You can come up with that. Yes, Right, so, so all right, Ricardo is saying how school affects society, how society affects school. That's partly it. Socialization is the way in which we are taught the norms of our culture and our society. We're taught both directly and indirectly. School is a massive agent of socialization. Other agents would be? Media. Media, church. family, church. That's about it. The workplace, I suppose, right? And then in the, when we talk now on the micro level of the classroom, we're talking about the social context of the classroom. So some of the things that affect social context of learning would be? Language. Language. Culture, right. So I'm looking for bigger picture items than, than language. Can you see this? This doesn't write. That's not good. Alright, forget about this. Tactic two. Plan B. Can't write. Can I borrow one? Because that's the only one they have. I want you to think of these three words. Four. Culture. Write them down. Culture. Race. Class. And gender. Everybody wrote down those four words. Culture, race, class, and gender, okay? Those are four things that impact the social context of the classroom. Thank you, Thalia. Let's try again. Yes, culture, race. I'm writing extra big for you people on TV screens. Class and gender, all right? Now, we discussed what this was, the way of life of a... Guys, got to wake up. I know it's a rainy day here, but you got to wake up. Culture definition is... Way of life of a people. Thank you, Shoshona. Class is just the socioeconomic level you're born into, or maybe move up into. Gender you're born with. Race you're also born with. Culture you acquire. Now we're going to play a little word game, which maybe will wake you all up. You have, remember I told you I was going to start each class with some little tip technique that you can play with and use in your own classes. Here's another one. Are you ready? Davey, you ready? I want you to make as many words as you can from these words. You can mix them all up. Here's one, ace. Here's one, end. I won't do that one. Um, cult is another one. Cure. Yeah, cure. There's a lot. Go, you have two minutes. Have fun. Go, 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 go. You can mix them up. It's a word game. I'm giving you a teaching tip, but I'm also waiting for people to show up, including the entire group from St. Lucia. No cheating? Not cheating, it's collaborating. <laughs> You can do whatever you want. Yeah, it can be as complex as you like. I'm timing, by the way. I said two minutes. We've only gone 30 seconds. 
Hi, Corby. As many words as you can make from those words. One minute to go. Ten seconds. Not that this really matters. This is just to get your brain fixed. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, how many of you have ten? How many of you got ten words out of that? How many of you got more than ten? How many of you got fifty? Nobody got fifty. Oh, really? Tracy, you got 50? Good for you. Well done. How many of you got 30? Or more? Good. How much did you get, Thea? 32. Oh, all right. Did any of you get at least 20? Yeah, all right, good. That's just, I'm not going to go over the words. It's not a vocabulary lesson. But that's good. Especially good for Tracy, who got more than 50. Now. We're gonna we're gonna play another game. Here's the next game. Not really a game, but you're gonna do it in each of your countries. I'm gonna do it in Jamaica, well in Kingston, and I'm gonna ask um, Dominica and Bermuda to do it amongst yourselves, and then you're gonna share with us. You're gonna ask and brainstorm as Jamaican. Well, no, we're doing Jamaica. I'm gonna model it for you. So my Jamaican people, as Jamaican as, give me something. For uh, Ricardo, as Jamaican as. All right, we start with Sonia. Miss Lou, thank you. Um, Ricardo, you're up. As Jamaican as. If you can't answer quickly, we pass you and come back. As Jamaican as, Dina. That's fine. I can't spell that, so I'm just going to write that. M U T E. Right. Okay, so you see what we're doing? So, Jason, you and the rest of your crew, you're going to do hi, Kiva. Hi, Vanessa. You're gonna do as Bermudian as, whatever comes to your mind. Okay, you get a few minutes to do that. Dominique, are you gonna do the same thing? Why am I shouting? Can you all hear me normally? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Zoe can play this game. Let Zoe play. Although she has a tablet, she's probably more interested in that, <laughs> right? All right, so let's continue. Don't mind what I'm doing with the Jamaicans. You guys do your own thing, and we'll come back to you. You answered already, Alyssa. I can't stop. <laughs> Somebody always says this. <laughs> okay, going over. Who's next? Uh, Courtney. 
I'm just going to put Bob. David. But a lot of you have food references. You're hungry. Are you hungry? Back to you, Ricardo. Um, no, no. Back to you, Ricardo. Back to you, Ricardo. No, we have Ashley already. You can't repeat. Ashley. Guys. All right. Back to you, Ricardo. Good boy. All right. So clearly, what one in this was food was the most popular answer, followed probably by music. All right. That's fine. Other other times I've done this, people have said, "We read you what they've said." Rice and peas, ackee and saltfish always comes up. Reggae music, dance hall, ganja, coconut drops, cornrows, rundown, sprinters, Usain Bolt, dominoes, Oliver Samuels, blue draws, champs, Sunday football, we said that. The motto out of many one people, Bob Marley, roadblocks, we want justice, Dudus, Dr. Bird, Miss Lou, and Black Bean and Gold. All right. Bermuda, are you ready? All right, go for it. As Bermudian as. Pick a spokesperson and go. It doesn't have to be Jason. Somebody else can speak. Not that we don't like to hear from you, Jason. Yes, read it, please. No, louder and slower. Fish cakes. Uh huh. Okay. Can't hear you. Can you move the mic closer to Tracy? Johnny Bread. Johnny Bread, okay. Food is dominating your list as well. Go ahead. <laughs> Try and speak into the mic. She is. Long tail. That's better. Long tail is what is that? A fish? A boat? Bird. A bird. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Codfish and potatoes. Codfish and potatoes, right? That was this All right. All right. So last time I did this, this was their list. Are you listening? Onion, codfish, and potatoes, which you had. Bermuda shorts. Cassava pie. Rum swizzle. Dark and stormy. I don't know if that's the clouds or that's a drink. I don't know. Um, farine pie, farine pie, farine pie. I don't know how to pronounce it. Long tail was there. Skink, kite, codfish cakes, baked macaroni and cheese, cup match, Boxing Day, May twenty fourth, non mariners race, and an island boat race. Sound familiar? Yeah. All right. Yes. It's very Caribbean. Yes. Dominica, you're up. I didn't do Dominica last time. They weren't here. Um, Dominica as um, sound coach. What's that? Um, Dominica. That is the um, salt fish and um, coconut milk. Okay. Unknown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dominique. As many waterfalls. Okay. As Dominique as many lakes, including one boy in the lake. Okay. As Dominique as something we call a bear. What's which that? Which is the same as um, um, gossip. Okay. All right. <laughs> 
Thank you. There's more? Yes, we have a list as Dominican as um, Buyo. Buyo music. Buyo. Um, Dominican as Buyo. Um, Dominican as Crapo. Um, what is that? Yeah. Yeah. Food? Yes. Food? 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 Uh, we were famous for our frog legs. Uh huh. Frog legs. Um, so Korean. So music. No, so Korean. Oh, so Korean. Um, coconut oil. Uh huh. Coconut cheese. Huh? Um, longevity. Um, Those are fish or birds? <laughs> the Cicero parrot. Oh, the Cicero is, um, parrot is a bird. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right. Yes, it's a bird. What else is your name? That's it. Okay, that's good. Thank you. St. Lucia, you all must be saying, what are they doing? Right, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, so we're beginning the discussion on race, class, gender, and culture. And we began by doing a quick word game where we asked people to make as many words as they can from all those words. You're not going to get to do that. You missed out on the game. It's all right. Then we went into reviewing the definition of culture. And we did a, this is another game, discussion breaker with discussion opener with um, the phrase, for in your case, would be as St. Lucian as. Can you tell us a few things that come to mind when you would say that, as St. Lucian as? Just go around the room quickly. One, start, and whatever side you want, and go. If somebody doesn't answer immediately, skip them. They put down the pitons, yes. Next one. The the only driving Okay, keep going. And then that's Oddfish. Oddfish seems to be a recurring thing. Go ahead. Our own bear, pizza bear. All right, keep going. Bounce around. Rum is also recurring. You all didn't say rum. Parrot. Parrot, okay, also recurring. Keep going where we reach. Where we reach? Raise your hand where we are at. Who's speaking next? What's going on? Okay. It's a fall festival. Okay. Creole festival. Happen. Keep going. Keep going. Where we reach? On. Jazz. Jazz. Okay. All right. Last. Last few. Calypso. Okay. All right. And last but not least, national costume. Okay, interestingly, one more from St. Lucio. Anybody else from St. Lucio? Yeah. I haven't heard the male voice from St. Lucio. <laughs> what you said? Sorry. You're back in our dance. Okay. Thank you. So the commonalities are also around food. Often, what you all referred to was food, interestingly, and then music. 
and all of you did the same thing, and some of them cross islands, which is part of the regional culture. So obviously you can have individual, national, and regional. Okay? All right. That's the end of my little games now. So why is it important that we talk about issues of culture in the classroom? Based on the movie oops, and the readings, why am I going to spend two and a half hours now talking about these issues? Raise your hand, Dina. Dina, loudly so that your colleagues can hear you. Good evening, everyone. Dina here. Um, most times, you know, we have cultural many things are intertwined, so that shows you that, hey, there's some equality and balance, so there's no need to be in a zone of discriminating and stuff like that, right? Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to add to that? Yes, we can relate to each other and um, perhaps both the students and teachers absorb what we are and right. learn. All right, so by using our culture. So you're, is, you're discussing tolerance and also being able to make a connection, right? To relate to each other, right? These are important important building blocks of any classroom. It doesn't matter what age you're teaching. And all of you, all of us, all of us will have the ability to reflect on our own experiences, either as a teacher or as a student, where one of those factors, our race, our class, our gender, what's my fourth factor? Our culture, just checking, right? Have impacted either opportunities given or denied to us, our performance, the, the praise, or the criticisms that we have received. So I want to ask each country to find one example. Discuss amongst yourselves. I'm not going to go to every pair again. We've already done that. Talk to each other. In the small groups, Bermuda, you can all talk to each other. You're, you're small in number. Dominica, you can all talk to each other. You're small in number. St. Lucia, you probably need to break your table in half. One half talks to each other. The other half talks to each other. Discuss a few examples and then pick one that you want to share with the group. Kingston is going to do the same thing. Um, have I given you an example? I'll give you an example from my own experience now. So when I was in college, I went to college in the Northeast, in Boston, and I used to volunteer. I used to do a lot of different volunteer activities. One of the activities that I did was serving in a homeless um, food kitchen. So the, the, the dorms would pick up, would take the food that wasn't eaten and they would be distributed to soup kitchens around the city. And some of us would volunteer and go on a Friday night and help to serve the food. You didn't get extra credit for this, you just did it because it was, you were interested. You, you probably now get extra credit, in those days you didn't. So I went and I was standing between my friend Michael, who was from Puerto Rico, myself, and my friend Alex, who was from, I don't want know what state he was from, I don't remember. And the men came to eat. And one man came to me, stopped at me, so he hadn't reached Michael yet. He stopped at me and he said, I'm not gonna take any food from that dago. So I'd never heard that phrase before. So I turned to Mike and I said, what could that be? And he said, oh, don't worry. It's, don't pay any attention. But the man would not move. He refused to have me serve him and then he wouldn't let Mike serve him because Mike was a stick. He was from Puerto Rico. So the two, the two of us didn't know what to do. Remember, we're 17, right? So Mike says to me, oh, it's a derogatory term for Italian-American. So my father's family is Italian-American, but because I grew up here, I've never heard that phrase. I had never heard that phrase. And apparently there are other such phrases, which I then learned. So he, we, we had to call the management, and he had to be escorted out, and, you know, all of that. But it, it stuck me because I had never had anybody refuse to have anything to do with me because of any particular issue in my life before. I mean, I've been called all kinds of things here, you know, Browning, Miss Chin, all kinds of things. But it's not that people don't engage with you. 
they are engaging with you by calling you those names. And when I go to different countries and I get in a taxi cab, they all think I'm from any country but Jamaica. So I'm used to that. I'm from either from India, I'm from Cuba, I'm from the Middle East, I'm from Puerto Rico, whatever. And if it's a Jamaican cab driver, it is even more difficult to convince the Jamaican cab driver. And I say, but I'm from Jamaica. No, no, no. Yes, and I can just, and we have a long, then comes a discussion about Jamaica and what parts, and eventually, they believe me. And then they discount my fare because they felt so badly that they didn't believe me in the beginning. So it works to my advantage in that sense. But I'm just giving you an example of how you can be unsuspectingly just judged by the basis of your looks. So that didn't happen to me in a classroom setting, but it happened to me in, a, in an out-of-class out activity that I was doing in a, in a school, in a school in a, on a campus. So that's one of my examples. You probably have better ones. Right? So, the Bermuda, you're all one group. Dominica, you're all one group. St. Lucia, you're going to divide yourself in half. I want two stories from St. Lucia, one from Bermuda, one from Dominica, and I'm going to get two from Kingston. Ready? You have 10 minutes. Go. You might have to move. Yes. Sonia already moved for that purpose. Thank you. So there's four, eight, ten. There's ten. So one, two, three, four. Just you guys. One example of a way you were stereotyped, either by race, class, gender, or culture. Any of those? It doesn't have to be in a bad way. It doesn't have to be in a bad way. It can be in a good way. It's often in a bad way. <laughs> Thank you. 
you have to forgive people's lack of exposure. You know, next, uh, you pick Dominica, but you can't pick Courtney. <laughs> pick a country, a country and a person if you know a name. You pick Dominica. Okay. And, but not Courtney, so I'll help you. Ashley. Uh, actually, Sonia's going to be here. That's fine. Oh, no. Sorry. 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 I found that there are boys, I was trained that a girl chose to take a because it was a boy in thumbnail. And you picked a gender experience. I'm glad for that. Thank you for helping me. That's nice. And but you persevered? Yes, I did. And they came to accept you and okay. very good. All right. You pick another person in Jamaica then. Another group. No, that's Ashley is in that group. So yes. I know you don't know the names, which is another reason why I ask you to do this because I want you to start learning the names. Thalia. This is Thalia. Turn around so she can see. That's Thalia. <laughs> they picked you, Thalia. Go loudly so that they can hear you. Representing my, my members here. Yes. Um, Mr. Matt Savage pointed out <laughs> because of his name, uh, they often, the interactions he has are not face to face. And when they do see him, they're surprised that somebody named Matt Savage looks as lovely and heavenly as he does. And then David followed that up with his own story of, of when he was in England. And um, because of his first and last name, they assumed similarly, and he went for an interview where the person was interviewing him, not only came down the stairs and saw that this was not an old white man full of knowledge, but also when he was talking to him, he actually knew what he was talking about. And at some point, David said, this, we're wasting each other's time. And the gentleman looked horrified, I would guess, um, based on, on his description, that here was somebody of this color not only knowledgeable, but actually being affronted by his treatment of him. So and telling him that. And exactly. Him and, that. And, and so we, yeah. we came to the conclusion that we're very blessed to live in the Caribbean where we yeah. don't have as many examples of that sort of thing. We, we don't in the Caribbean have as many examples of that by race. By what race. we have is more examples perhaps by class. Right. Okay, last in Kingston and then you will go, we'll go to Bermuda or Dominique. St. Lucia, sorry. Can you, you're here now. You're helping me, thank you. I don't get to someone. Who's going to speak? Alyssa, Nina, Ricardo, which one? Um, no, I, okay, this is Dina again. Um, I don't know if they can hear you. Jason, can you hear Dina? Dina? Hi, Jason. Hi. Right. So hold on, stop, stop. So listen. You all need to just think of how tricky this is for me to try to deal with all of you and the technology. So if at some point you cannot hear what I'm trying, what is being said in any other country, you need to jump up and down and make a lot of noise so that we can fix that because it's hard to have a classroom discussion with you in these different places and being separated by the technology. The technology is wonderful because it brings you to us and us to you, but there are glitches. So if you cannot hear, you need to do something to let me know so that I can tell Craig who will solve it. Because I can't fix it, right? So let's try again. Dina? Hi, everyone. Can you hear her? Okay, thank you. Okay, well, with my case, I really didn't pay attention to these things. However, um, one case when I was transferred from a preparatory school to a, a, a primary school and I, I left from grade two, went to grade three and uh, I had very long hair in the middle of my back and my stepmom would mostly twist or plait it and stuff and uh, I was new to the school so I would only see my nephew and we'll speak and I'll speak to the teachers and I'll say hello, good morning and everything to everyone but I didn't have much friends. 
and uh, some girls just backed me up in a corner one day with scissors saying they're going to cut my hair off because I'm too stush and I think because of my hair and stuff like that. But um, I just got my way out. They were saying I'm going like a better than people and all of that. But I didn't pay much attention to that because I said, you know, I'm new to the school and I really just didn't really... My father got involved with some stuff though that boys used to do because they wanted to see underneath my clothes and so on. And when I'm going to sit down, they pulled the chair and for me to fall. And my father got very stern and visited the school. Um, and he got very stern. And when he visited the school and spoke about all of this, they actually, the boys would, when I'm coming to class, they would actually pull the chair out for me to sit. And stuff like that. No good parts that I've experienced. Persons, they've seen me and they're like, I have very hairy skin, you know, and the hair just lays down on my skin. And they're like, um, they're always calling me Indian. So I'm like, guys, I'm not Indian. Why are you calling me Indian? So I just go home and I ask my dad, Daddy, what am I? But what am I mixed with? And he's like, a lot of things. But hey, you're Jamaican. Right. So, yeah. so, so the, difference, the difference for her is that she had a strong support network at home. So it wasn't eroding her self-esteem. And children can be very mean and do very mean things out of the eye of the teacher. And the teacher can't always see it, but it can affect how the student is performing. So you have to keep your eye out for how they're interacting and keep your... You're, uh, keep aware of the pulse of the class and what's taking place, right? That's not easy to do. And some teachers don't do it. But if you're going to work within the social context of the classroom, and I'm going to send you the definition, the definition I'm working with is, it's really all that the students and teachers do to help make sense of each other. And these things that they do usually have to have factor, factoring in their understandings and expectations. So the social context has to deal with the understandings and expectations the teachers have of the students, the students have of the teachers, and of each other and of themselves, right? Because that impacts their performance. Some girls won't speak because they don't want to be made fun of, or some boys, vice versa. You've given examples of race, class, and gender, which is very good. Thank you for that. Moving now to Bermuda. Okay. It's always Jason. Hi, Jason. Hi, Jason. Yeah. Uh, story about something that happened to me. I was in uh, Argentina visiting a friend, and we were at this restaurant. Nice. And seemingly, it seemed like there was a serious of providing people with darker skin. So I guess a lot of the people who were serving in the restaurant had to be darker skin because they came from another country or something like that. In South America. But in any case, it was like a, I think they had like a salad bar or something where you go up and get a tray to blend your food. And as I was going up to get my food, this lady uh, actually just came up to me with her tray with like super thin and edges. And she gave it to me as if, like, you know, here, take care of this for me kind of thing. Oh and I don't know exactly why she did that, but it seemed like there was a racial uh, kind of prejudice on her part. But you were an adult at the time? You were yes. an adult. So you just were able to brush that off and not really worry about it too much. You were confident yeah. in, in and of yourself. Right. So so luckily a lot of the experiences you all are sharing, you all had strong, you were resilient. Right? But think of what would happen to students who are not resilient. And the perfect example of that is the group in that class in the movie. Right? So they had been beaten down, beaten down, beaten down, and it was really her job. She realized early on one of her jobs was to try and bring them back up, build them back up. All right. Thank you, Jason. Last but not least is St. Lucia. Who's going to speak first? Speak. Okay. Thank you. I think my example is about culture. It's a positive one. Oh, that's what um, When I went to study in the U.S. I studied in Alabama at Alabama a and m and it's a predominantly black school and there are a lot of black persons in, in that state. So we normally get summer jobs or those part-time jobs and <clears throat> with employment agencies. Usually it will be at restaurants or at um, factories on the production floor 
Most of the time, the black persons go to the production floor and the white persons go to those other offices. However, <clears throat> when I started speaking, because I have a different accent, everybody wanted to know where I was from, and I said, Samisha, but they couldn't really identify what Samisha was, but then I said the Caribbean, and from the time I said the Caribbean, then I became exotic. And everybody wanted to know about everything in the Caribbean and how our life was, and I was always on the beach drinking apple from the coconuts and all of that. And it always, <laughs> I always got to get the better positions, the better jobs, and I always ended up at the office because I was from the Caribbean. Yes, there's a fascination with the Caribbean, I tell you. There is, a, well, I know more about the fascination with Jamaica, given that that's where I say I'm from. But a friend of my, my brother's girlfriend was just in Los Angeles and she was buying something in a store and the man said to her, oh, I love your accent, where are you from? And she said, oh, I'm from Jamaica. And the man was so excited, he started to ask, oh, how he loves Tessa and Chin and how he voted for her on The Voice and how this, he watch it and how it's a, what is it like and does it look like he thinks it looks like and held her at the cashier for a long time asking a whole heap of questions. This is not unusual, I'm sure this has happened to some of you, right? And so it's, it's interesting how you can have the positive and the negative. You know, when I left Jamaica and went away to school, I left and went to a, a I didn't do my A-levels, I just did my O-levels and I went to a school before I went to college. That's another story and I won't bore you with that. Anyhow, it was a great school and I was very fortunate to go. But the, one of the first things a student said to me was, how does it feel now for you not to be in the minority anymore? And I thought to myself, what are you, I said, what, what minority are you talking about? And they said, well, in Jamaica, the, the, the people in your classes must have been all African Jamaican or dark skinned Jamaican. We've never seen a Jamaican that looks like you before. And I said, well, how many Jamaicans have you seen? And they, you know, obviously they hadn't seen many, right? So I said, well, you know, I had never thought of it that way. And a lot of my friends were mixed with different backgrounds. And when I started to explain that to them, you know, you, you, they, they might have an Irish name, but they might look Chinese, which is true. I have a friend who's, whose name is Susan Chen, who looks Irish, but has a Chinese name, typically Irish, red hair and green eyes, right? But she's named, her name is Susan Chen. And then I have another friend who looks Chinese, whose name is Cindy Gawson. And that, that, that name, and they, they never know what's happening when Cindy's showing up, right? Because she doesn't look at all like what her name is gonna sound like, like the examples you've given. So it's, it, you know, I think if, the, if children come to grow up in a home and a school that reinforces their self-esteem, then they're better equipped to take on whatever the world is gonna throw at them. And sometimes it can be positive, and sometimes it can be negative, right? Is there one more example from St. Lucia before I move on to the readings? Okay, we have one on race. Okay, go ahead. Um, I spent a year studying in Taiwan a few years ago, and I was part of some groups in the university, and I was always the only black person there. And whenever we had get together the party, they would always play some black music for me. So they would probably play some hip hop or some rap, and then they would all come around and ask if they want to dance it and, and things like that. It was a little fancy, I was more amused by the whole thing. Right. Because you weren't insecure. Right. Yeah. So so these are some of the things that you don't you don't explicitly explicitly teach your children, teach your students. I might refer to them as children, because to me students are part of your family. So you you'll hear me sometimes slip and say children. But it's important, it's part of the hidden curriculum. And it, in, it can impact how they learn. So it factors into the social context of the classroom. So in the reading, you had two readings today. One was specifically about gender, which was written by a Jamaican author who is currently the principal or the acting principal of one of our teachers' colleges. And his piece really spoke to issues that Jamaica faces with our boys. Thank you as opposed to our girls. And we've mentioned that before in this class, that in Jamaica, the expectations for boys always seem to be slightly lower than for girls. So if, if a family has five children and they can only find lunch money for three, they will tend to send the girls more than the boys, particularly in rural Jamaica. So many schools in rural Jamaica have been coming up with these incentivized programs to increase attendance that include 
tech bop type things. There'll, there'll be school gardens where they're growing food and selling it, uh, poultry raising, things that interest the boys and will bring them to school. And it's showing and they get food, they get fed. That's also a, something that's an incentive. Because in rural Jamaica, we have higher incidences of poverty. Jamaica shows up as, a, as amazingly in United Nations speak as a middle income country. But it also shows up as one of the countries with one of the widest disparities of income or largest inequity. So whereas if you look and you see, well, 88% of the population, and I'm not making up that number, I read that recently, 88% of the population has a television and probably more than that has a phone, a cellular phone, but there are still schools with flush without toilets and there are still homes without water, it, more so in the deep rural areas. So he was talking about why is it important to, to think of the impact gender can have? He's not the only one. The article that I gave you, I think, was uh, the one that you could access online, was giving you a comp. It was part of an online discussion that had references to other pieces, in particular one by a noted Jamaican professor called Hyacinth Evans, which, who wrote a book called Inside Jamaica School System, which was her dissertation years ago. Sadly, a lot of what she found still exists. And what she found was that, you know, the boys would be placed in the back of the room. The boys wouldn't be called on as frequently when she was writing about gender. She wrote about other issues, but in the chapter on gender, that's some of the findings that she found, that she came up, that she came across. I don't know, when I went to a teacher education program, and I did that in America, they did not introduce this to me, this concept that perhaps people have different expectations for boys and girls. And certainly we learned that boys learn differently than girls. And that is why it's fascinating to see when you have schools in Jamaica that are segregating boys and girls in the same age group, so that there's one class of all boys, one class of all girls, and a mixed class in the same community, same school, same teachers, same qualifications, same years of experience, as best as you can do that and seeing how the boys are performing in relation, how the children perform in relation to each other. And what did they find? This is a school called Poly Ground Primary. What did they find? They found that the boys perform stronger, more consistently on their own than when they're mixed with the girls. This is a primary school, okay? It is very interesting. It's very interesting. And it's interesting to me why that hasn't been replicated more. But that's another story. Montego Bay, you're joining us? Hello? Yes. OK. We can hear you. We're discussing the article by Dr. Clark on gender. you have a question? Sorry, a second. Montego Bay, you have to turn off your, what is it, their, their mic. We, we're getting feedback. No? Can you mute the mic? Still getting it. Great, thank you. That's good. All right, yes, Ricardo, you have a question or a comment? Yes, I would say that at the school that I teach from grade seven to nine, mm -hmm. they separate boys and girls. Oh, really? So we have gender classes. And how does that work? What school is that? Um, Frankfurt High School. Oh, so. it, it, it's it works. Awesome. It, it, it works for me. I think it works because work. the boys, when they meet, before, that, before the meeting, the boys and girls were together and there were a lot of chaos. The boys were more active and losing out and listening. And the girls were complaining that they're not going to the boys' activity and the maturity and 
apart from that, you know, because they're in a girl class, I think about, you know, relationship wise. Well, that's a hard age to teach. That's like, that's a hard age, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, there's a lot going on in their bodies and in their minds at the time, which is distracting them from whatever you're trying to teach. So this kind of what this school has been able to separate them. And they are more, it's, it's, the results are much better. I still finding the result of, um, the boys are better? No, no. The boys are better. The boys are better. The boys are better. The boys are better. Yeah. But the boys are still better. Is that true? The boys are still failing? I don't think. I think in, in the boy class, yeah, it still has the, the different level of, of um, student in terms of their, their cognitive ability. And same likewise the girls, it's, they are different level of cognitive ability. So right, they're mixed classes, yes, yeah, in terms of academic, yeah. So basically, they're as opposed to the girls, you find more girls meeting the target, but the boys, the, the boys, the bright boys are in the class, they are not far from the bright girls. It's just probably a small percent. Right. So, so what, what's happening now, too, in Jamaica, I don't know if the other islands are doing anything similar. Jamaica has been looking at ways to gain and keep the attention of the boys. So they're trying to develop ways to infuse games and sports and more active learning in the curriculum. Is that happening in Bermuda or St. Lucia or Dominico? Let me go one by one. Bermuda, you have any problems with boys and girls? Or everybody's doing well? Can you say that again, Kiva, into the mic? You do the same thing here, but you're not only for the uh, spots, but for boys and girls. Oh, right. Right. Well, no, don't misunderstand me. The games-based activities are meant for boys and girls. It's not only for boys, but they're they're looking closely to see how the boys respond because they've had harder, they've had a more a bigger struggle in getting the boys to have consistent levels of achievement. That's what. That's what we struggle with in the lower over lower parts of the system, lower echelons. At the tertiary level, you have boys that, that constitute larger numbers of certain subjects, the sciences and math, yeah. right? And then you have more females in the social sciences, the hu human um, humanities and uh, teaching. This is an example. In all of your, where you're all sitting, it's an example. Right? Look around, how many males are there? And yet there's always a decision, there's always a cry for more role models, more male role models as teachers. Why? Because there's issues with parents and lack of father role models and so on. And that's, that's true regionally. That's also true in many states in America. It's not just a Caribbean problem. Challenge. So what about you, St. Lucia? You have any particular issues in gender with gender? Um, we were just discussing like we have the common entrance and the top ten students, the majority would be girls. Probably like in the top ten, probably three would be boys and the rest are girls. And we went um a nice school, we tried it an all boys school, and we, we had a professional development session and it was like well, they were telling us that it's, it's been proven that girls but she are faster than boys. Yeah. So when they do the common entrance in um, at 11, 12, you would find girls would outperform the boys. But then when it comes to CSEC, the boys tend to do CSEC on such level that the boys outshine the girls sometimes because in my game, we're actually the top performer for many years as in the boy. Yeah, that's but then yes, before that it has always been boys. When I was at the my around my years and before and after me was always boys who were the highest performers and all the things. And yeah. I I I agree with her because it's true that girls around 12, 13, they tend to be more sexual than the boys are still running around 
intelligences will discuss that in greater depth but that way you can appeal both to boys the in things that interest boys and things that interest girls and then the, ac the activities so that everything that you're grading is not only a test that you have to sit down and take or an essay that you have to write but maybe you have to perform something you have to build something you have to draw something you have to say something so that you mix up your assessments and also, Dr. Park talked about that, but he also talked, spent a lot of time talking about how your gender identity is formed, right? So how from a very young age in Jamaica, he was specifically speaking about Jamaica, we have a certain concept of what, mas cultural concept of what masculinity is, right? So you'll hear boys tell you, and I've heard boys tell me that they don't want to be seen in their community walking around with too many books because it's, it's considered not to be a very manly, thing to do. So they have to hide their books or they have to be careful where they're walking. Don't look at me like that, Dina. I've had more than one young man tell me that. No, no, no. Right? And yes, they, I really just, you know, Yeah, but it's sad, I, but it's true. No, it's, it's something that I actually, I actually experienced yeah. in a manner. Not yeah. me, actually, but I saw it happen. Yeah. So, and from a young age, even within the home, the way the chores are divided, there are certain chores that are seen to be male chores or what the boys are going to do and what the girls are gonna do, right? So what, what would that be? You'd see the girls doing more of the cooking and the cleaning and the washing and the taking, helping to take care of the younger sibling, if there is one. And the boy would be taking out the garbage, sweeping out the yard, right? If they're doing any of that, right? But the day-to-day -day activities that the girls are doing a lot of it, helping their mothers, right? And the boy is to be the man of the house. He's to be the protected one. You don't want the girls out on the corner, but you're gonna, you might not, some mothers are not as, as stringent, as strict with the boys, but they're very aware of their girls, right? And he talks about that. He talks about how from a very young age, and it's not just in Jamaica. Culturally, we do that. So we have, we have um, certain colors that are identified with boys and certain colors that are identified with girls. I don't know who started that, but we, but that seems to be that seems to be something that we do in the West. I'm sure in the East they have different colors, but in the West we have pink and blue, right? And so now you have some men who are blending that, and they're wearing pink and they're wearing purple. Okay, I, personally, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Some people have a problem with it. They're wearing, you know, men are wear back wearing earrings. Men are men are getting men are getting manicures and pedicures and waxing and doing all these things that are seen to be feminine. Feminine. And a perfect example of this, there's a name for this term. There's a name. There's a name. Metrosexual. Thank you, Thalia. That's the name. Metrosexual. And the, and the and the the poster boy of metrosexuals is, can you guess? Oh, how do you know that? Did you say that? You ruined my suspense, <laughs> right? And the poster boy for that is David Beckham. Yeah. Yeah, well, he's married to whatever. But, but he himself, in how he dresses and how he takes care of himself and all of that, the, the media has dubbed him the metrosexual. You see how Thalia could answer my question right away? She knew it. So there's, there's a, something of a blending, but what happens to some of our young boys who are doing that? Depending on the culture that you're in, they could be mislabeled. And that could cause additional challenges for their self-esteem, especially in a country like Jamaica. Or their life. Or their life, yes. I don't know, I don't get the impression that issues of 
um, conflicting um, sexual identity are as drastic culturally in the other islands as they are in Jamaica. But you can certainly change my opinion if, if that is the case. In Jamaica, homosexuality is very taboo and, uh, and very controversial. I don't know how it is in Bermuda, but that's something that you might come across teaching adolescents. Louder. Bermuda, go ahead. Sub-Saharan Africa. So, yes, you can Google that. We have a very high rate of HIV AIDS in this region. I'm not talking about by country, I'm talking about in the region. I don't know Jamaica's rate, the Caribbean region. Yeah. So, it's an issue that adolescent, adolescents struggle with. And if they have no guidance counselors or they, have, they can't talk to their parents, they might need to talk to their teachers. Whatever your personal opinion is, you, you need to keep it to yourself and show tolerance and help to refer that child to somebody who can help them. That's my opinion. I'm not telling you what you have to do, but that's my opinion. It's not fair to the child, to the student, to judge the student. And it's something that comes across. And if they connect with you, you might be that adult that they connect with. And it's a real issue. It's not a make-believe issue. It's a real issue that adolescents struggle with. And you may think, I'm going into teaching, I don't, that's not what I'm doing. I'm here to teach them math, I'm here to teach them language, I'm here to teach them history, and yes, you're primarily there to do that, but if you happen to be that adult with whom they connect, and they come to you, you have to have a plan of what you're going to do. Um, all right, on that note, it's now 525, I'm going to give you your 10 minute break. When you come back, this is what I'd like you to do. The second piece which is the article by Stephen Carbone, or Carboni, I don't know how his name is pronounced. I would like each country, um, you can take one Bay off here because they're not there. They're just naked, everybody else looks small. Um, or blank the screen or something. This article rates class oppression. I want each of you to pick a line or a phrase in the article that you think is really seminal or important in relation to the social context of the classroom. So, St. Lucia, you will pick two lines. Bermuda, you will pick one or two. Each of you pick one or two lines that speak to you. And then we'll take that and move to the second half of the class. So you have a 10-minute break. When you come back, start doing that, please. Okay? Any questions? If you don't have it, I have it. We've already heard it. You are supposed to take your break and then look at the article, Race, Class, Oppression, I don't remember the rest of the title, and pick one or two lines or a sentence or a paragraph that you think is important or related to the topic, 
the social context of the classroom. A line or a paragraph that speaks to you. Alyssa, you're going to have to move again. Let's move what? Yeah, but after the break. Oh, I have another one here.
He's not on. That means he's off. Oh, hi, Vernon. Can you hear me? 
Vernon, can I type? Can I type to him? But when he comes back, you just signal. Are you guys ready? All right. Hi, Vernon. Hi, Vernon. Hello. Sorry. Uh, good Hi, good evening. You've been hearing us okay the whole time? Yes, I've been hearing you quite clearly. All right. Did you hear what I was asking you to do about with that article about by Stephen Carbone, race class? Okay. Um, no, I think I might have missed it. All right. Okay. So then you're just gonna listen to the discussion, okay? And then um, I'll try to involve you in the second part, okay? All right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All right. We're gonna begin back again. It's 10 minutes, roughly. Hi. Hi. How are you? Your classmates beside you can tell you what we're, we're using that article that you just have there in front of you. All right, so using the article by Stephen Carboni, or Carbone, or Carbone, that's easier to say. Um, let's start with uh, Dominica. What, what section spoke to you? Read the section and tell us why. <laughs> Just pick one. Hold on a second. Zoe has a friend. Hi. What's your friend's name? Hi. Okay. Go ahead, Dominico. Um, it is known that authentic existence and therefore respect and education cannot exist without freedom. Okay, so that freedom itself. Uh -huh. What page? First, second, third? This, um, the second page. All right, go again. It is known that. Authentic existence. And therefore, respect and education cannot exist without freedom. But that freedom itself is at times innately feared by the oppressed because of their internalization of the oppressed system itself. Okay, now you know what you have done with that? You have picked an example that explains the concept of symbolic violence. Read that sentence again, that part, go ahead. Okay. It, is known it is known that authentic existence and therefore respect and education cannot exist without freedom. 
but that freedom itself is at times innately feared by the oppressed because of the internalization of the oppressive system itself. Okay, and why did that speak to you, your group? I underlined that too, by the way. That's one of the parts that I underlined, and I think that Alyssa underlined it too, and probably a few others have underlined that. Tell us why you you picked that one. Uh, um, no, we, we didn't. I mean, that was my underline. Um, I can tell you why I chose it. Go ahead. I chose because um, it spoke to me that. Um, you cannot get somebody want in fear. And, and if um, a student exists in your classroom in fear or um, without freedom, you know, education doesn't take place. And also, if a child doesn't feel respected, you know, it doesn't um, take place. And also, um, the internalized oppressed system itself. You know, that speaks to, to most um, system, um, what should we say, the hidden systems that, that we just not realizing. Right. You know, and we don't really realize. And yes, and so the teacher has a lot of power in the classroom. There's a power dynamic in every classroom. The teacher is at the head, so the teacher has more power. I'm coming, I'm coming, coming. Let me just make this point. So the teacher has a, has a responsibility, you could say, to set the tone of the social context of the classroom. Not only to set the tone of the academic work, not only to set the tone of the curriculum and the pace at which it's delivered, but also sometimes you don't have a choice as to what the curriculum is because the administration has made that choice for you or the government has made that choice for you. But the how it's delivered and the context in which it's delivered the teacher has dominion over to some extent and that can help or hinder a child the child can either be sitting there in fear because of the way the teacher speaks to him or to his colleagues his, his peers rather or the way the teacher looks at him or the way the teacher ignores him whatever it might be so you picked a really good section to highlight I want to thank you for that who had a question which country <laughs> When she mentioned in the meeting about uh, a child should have freedom in the classroom, I would like to elaborate a little bit about it. What kind of freedom a child should have in the classroom? All right, you want to take that, Dominico? Yeah, I want to take that. Did you hear the question? Yeah. Freedom in the classroom. Did you hear the question? We did not. The question, not. Was, Please repeat. the question was, what kind of freedom should a child have in the classroom? Um. Freedom to be herself or himself. I mean, uh, freedom to just be human. Because uh, according to the reading, in the context of the reading, uh, what they're really describing as freedom from oppression. Right. So oppression means whether you race, gender, class, creed, whatever religion you are, right. you have a right to be at peace in your classroom. That's right. So it's, it's not. It's not. Of, of license is a matter of just human existence. That's beautifully said. Beautifully said. She doesn't mean that the child has the freedom to jump up and down and not listen to the teacher. There's elements of respect, mutual respect. When the teacher is teaching, the class, the child is to pay the student to pay attention, and when the student is speaking, the teacher is to pay attention. So there's an element of respect and human dignity. You're modeling that in your classroom. That's what she's talking about. She's not saying the child has the freedom to do whatever he or she likes. That's not, it's not that simplistic. It's, it's much, it's a more esoteric meaning. <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Let's go to um, Bermuda then. Let's have a line that you all picked. One or two. Somebody that maybe hasn't spoken. Tracy has spoken for today. Jason has spoken for today. Ashley spoke. Kiva has spoken. Well, all of you have spoken, pretty much, except mm -hmm. Vanessa. I had um, the second paragraph at the bottom of page two, 
Sorry, 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 sorry. You've got to speak into the mic and loudly. Bottom of page two, I got that. Second paragraph to the bottom. It is unclear how a student could strive to succeed academically if they have no hope of a positive future result given their current circumstances. It is unclear how a student should 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 strive to seek to succeed academically if if they have no hope of a positive future result given their current circumstances. Okay, so that has to do with possibly class or race. I just want to point out that in the purposes of this discussion, religion would fall under culture, okay? I didn't disaggregate out religion. Um, why did you choose that one? A student can't see any hope for themselves. You know, there's no chance of becoming a lawyer. Why study that hard? If they're going to end up as a farm laborer, they don't need to know how to work. Um, it, it's just their motivation to actually do well. Right, so that goes back to the whole concept of education as a means to an end or um, education learning for life or just learning for a means to an end, right? Which we discussed in the first lesson, in the first class, the different meanings of education. But it also speaks to um, the student's hopes and expectations for him or herself and the capacity to see education as possibly opening doors for the future. That's what... I can't think of a better example of that than what the teacher in the movie did. If, she, if those students had not had that teacher, their life trajectories would have been very different. Despite the, the fact that it possibly was glamorized a bit because it's a Hollywood film. But the fact is that it was based on a true story. And, and there are teachers in classrooms all over the world that make that kind of impact on a daily basis. We just don't hear about them, but we know that they're there. Otherwise, many people would stop teaching. Like that lady that uh, we showed in the TEDx talk, right? And her mother, when she talked about her mother's funeral and how many people came back. So, yes, another element of teaching, which is not written down in the job description, is to help raise students' own expectations of themselves. So thank you for that. That's good. That's another good line, a different dimension of the discussion. Let's move to um, St. Lucia. Who wants to share one of their lines? Thank you, Bermuda. In the classroom, the teacher's various challenges can still hope. The sense of hope can be fostered on a plan for the future developed. An accurate student may be able to find their motivation to succeed in school and move to a later. Okay, Today, hold on. Go back to the beginning, go slowly, and tell us if you can what page it's on, please. <laughs> Page two. It's on page two. Uh huh. Paragraph one. Paragraph one. Nine. 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 Nine.
if a sense of hope can be fostered, notice this, the author saying if, because it's not always a given. If a sense of hope can be fostered and a plan for the future developed, an at-risk student may be able to find the motivation to succeed in school and work to better their prospects for a better life. I'm going to send you another talk by a gentleman um, for probably next week or the week after. He's a state senator from Colorado, maybe. His first name is Michael. I can't remember his last name. And he gave a talk. I don't think it's a TEDx talk. It just happens to be a talk. Um, where he describes what he did as the principal of a school. And he was a former member of Teach for America. He was a lawyer, trained as a lawyer originally. And he gives a very powerful talk. When I first heard the talk, I didn't hear it in person. I saw it on video. Um, it brought tears to my eyes. I will not make the mistake of having you watch it again here because if you can't even hear what Bermuda is saying like that, then you're not going to be able to watch. It'll lose its, it, it'll lose its effectiveness. So I will send the link and ask you to watch it. It's simply too long for you to watch if you can't hear half of it. It's not like the lady, the TEDx lady that was short. So I'm going to send that and it speaks, it speaks exactly to this point where what he tried to do with his team was instill a sense of hope and work towards developing a plan, a future plan for their students, and what happened to them. The entire school that he was teaching in was a school of at-risk students. Okay? So you'll, uh, believe me, it's a powerful speech. The interesting thing about that man is that he was a lawyer, then he joined Teach for America, then he taught, then he became a principal, and now he became either a senator or a governor, or a governor and then a senator. I can't remember what it is he became first. But he's now in a position to change laws that affect education. And he has the experience of being on the front line. So his understanding of issues relating to principals working on contract or not working on contract have different dimensions for him. So when he goes to Capitol Hill in the US, he's arguing from a different perspective. And that's an example how seeds of change can take root. And that's the whole idea behind Teach for America, which you will read about later on, okay? All right, back to, back to St. Lucia. Tell us why you chose, chose that line, if you can, please. <laughs> Let me write down that I said I'm going to send that. Um, I chose that line because I teach mathematics, and a lot of the times, if the students feel that um, they're not going to use that, um, just as a simple example, just one concept, if they're not going to use it in, in real life, then they feel that it's not relevant, they don't have to learn it. And it's the same thing with all subjects. If they don't have to learn it, they're not going to use it. If they're not, they're not going to use it in their life. Okay. Very well said. You all are very eloquent today. Thank you. Is there anybody else in St. Lucia who would like to share a line, or shall I move to another country? Anybody else? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, yes, I just have one. Okay, go ahead. Tell us the page, please. The fourth page, the last photo. I'm not sure. It's okay, go ahead. It says, why do we put so much? That's how I have it. It's not bad. Go ahead, go ahead. It's okay, we'll find it. And why do we put so much of our attention and resources into trying to fix what goes on in, inside low performance schools when the quality of low performance may reside outside of the school? Okay, that's a good one. Everybody heard that? Why do we put so many resources? into trying to fix low performing schools when what goes on in the schools are impacted by what happens outside the school. Why did you pick that one? Share with us, please. I chose that because um, one of the articles that you sent to, to us 
it says that the problem of local common school has to do with um, economics. I think when you solve most of this problem, if not all, because it also said based on studies that those schools that have more resources and more affluent students perform better based on tests. And that outside of the school, the major problem is poverty. So if we can impact um, knowledge and money into these communities, they will do better because they don't have money for food, they don't have money for the school, a lot of other things, medical, health, etc. So if we can impact money, that would be solve most of the problems. Children will tend to perform better, etc. etc. Okay. Do you agree with that? Totally. Partially. Who says partially? Me. Uh, I know there are, there are two schools in Bermuda that they um uh, that provide lot breakfast for students, for example, breakfast for students who don't have breakfast and even lunch at time, I guess. And these students and they, some of them still not get for farming where they're still not trying to farm in life. I think it rests on here, and I think it rests more like on the uh, on the side of the parent on the front of the black parent violence for them. For example, I think many of them have too many big responsibilities at home and they can't focus on something going on in the, within the home that caused them not to cope up. But because food is being provided, guidance is being provided, there are many things that you just mentioned that they are talking about, they're still misbehaving. That, that's a that's a very difficult that's a very difficult issue that is raised by that quote that that intent actually underlines a lot of policy development a lot of policy design a lot of programming tries to figure out how do you give students a better opportunity to access learning right it's not it's not only one factor it's not the teacher necessarily although we do know that a, a teacher that is a, I don't want to use the word superstar, but like the teacher in the movie, that they can, even despite all those other debilitating conditions, the students can achieve relative to, to their own performance. Maybe not relative to the kids in the AP classes who are already there, but relative to themselves, to where they were six months before, a year before, right? So what that line brings to mind really is the essence of education reform, which has taken it outside the classroom as well to look at school feeding, to look at parenting education programs, counseling, so that children can have greater equality of opportunity. That's how you, that's how you begin to narrow the divide between those that have and those that don't have. But we haven't found the, the there's no cookie cutter model that's going to work. What works in San Francisco is not going to work in Dallas. What works in Dallas in its entirety is not going to work in Miami. What works in Miami in its entirety is not going to work in Jamaica. So each country has to adapt different models and see and find what works for them. And it's an ongoing process. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Jamaica now, to Kingston. Antigua Bay is back, but nobody's there. Let's go to the front. Okay, we chose. Loudly, please. Um. Class distinctions are in okay. page, sorry. First page two, I believe. Okay. okay. Class distinctions. Class distinctions are incredibly powerful determinants of the quality of schooling an individual receives, as well as how that individual might interact with peers and society as a whole. So that actually piggybacks on something that was just said from the previous quote. So that's a nice transition. Right, so economic in the influence of your economic position. Right, and why did you pick that? Um, so it has two points: a, influencing the quality of education. Um, naturally, if you have more money, you're able to send your your child to schools with better facilities, in nicer environments, um, schools with with top-notch facilities where, where the students can really benefit. Um, also recently, I have an example because recently I was participating in a socioeconomic survey of persons with disabilities, and so I surveyed two persons, both the children had intellectual disabilities, one very low income, one 
middle income. And so the low income person was saying, there's a particular school, Genesis Academy, was saying her child has not been going to school at all because she's just not picking up and she can't afford the Genesis fee. Whereas the person from the middle income, she was complaining that she's not getting any help, but at the same time, she could afford to send her child to Genesis. So just because she didn't have the money, her child could not benefit from even the facilities that exist for her child who has a disability. Also, if you have more money than your child is likely to have better attendance at school, as opposed to if you have no money, sometimes your, your child might miss because there's no money for you to go. Um, as it relates to how you interact with peers and the society, um, sometimes students, they have an opinion of themselves based on where they're from. So for example, in my class the other day, a student came in and she was singing a particular song, and I said, Alicia, I'm not in the class. And she said, Mr. Gitton, I'm come from me, now you have to sit with me. Yeah. So based on where you're from, based on where they're from, they think, you know, I should behave this way because I'm from this place. And sometimes you have an inferiority complex, especially if you're in a mixed classroom with persons from low income, high income. You think, okay, so I'm from this place. So they're probably saying, you know, I'm not as good as them. So it may manifest itself in you being shy and not speaking up, expressing your opinion. Or the opposite. Or it may result in you being aggressive or, you know, bullying the others because you think, okay, maybe I don't have as much as you, but I'm stronger. You know, I know the streets, so you bully others or you act up. I just want, and, and I want to point out that what you're saying is that as a teacher, you have to not just immediately judge the behavior, but try to understand where the behavior is coming from and how you can use it to your advantage, how you can help to teach the child. That's a life lesson. Right? So that's when those kinds of opportunities present themselves. And you raise an important point about disabilities. Everything that's written in this will be compounded if your child had a disability. Right? And special needs. All right, thank you. Next row. Taylor, are you speaking again? Okay. Shoshana. All right. Loudly, loudly, loudly. Can you hear? Hold on. Bermuda, can you hear? Yes. Dominica, can you hear? Yes. yes we can. And St. Lucia. Yes. yes. Excellent. And Vernon, I know you can hear. Okay. All right. The yes, Vernon. Um, just to follow up what she said. She, her is, name is Alyssa. Alyssa, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading from page two, third paragraph. Recognizing each student as an individual is the first step in rising above the paradigms created by such living. A teacher who views his or her class through the lens created by racist or classist stereotypes serves only to perpetuate the oppression that is already in place. All right, so I chose this. Why? Because uh, it doesn't help for you to have preconceived notions of what your students are like before you go to the classroom. That can be an hindrance to you as well as to them because then you have that always in the back of your mind and you continue to treat them just one way based on what you have heard. So, and that's a lesson that sometimes you need to remind yourself of. After you've been teaching for a long time, you might get jaded and you might forget that. And that's something that with reflection, you keep, can keep reminding yourself. But that's also, again, a very important point. Why I asked you to do this activity is because there are many important ideas that I think he expresses very well in a short article. And so rather than me standing up here and saying, okay, I liked this line, these are key things he said, I'm trying to involve you all in the discussion. Right? Last but not least. Well, we actually chose the verse. This is that. Ashley, loudly speaking. We found, uh, we actually chose the very similar point in the time. It was, it is vital, I'm not, we're looking up the website, I'm not sure what page what's towards the end. Okay. The paragraph of the end of the day, we are breaking up the assumption that we're learning. Towards the end is all I can tell you. I don't see it. Keep going. The danger of making assumptions is ever lurking is the first line, right? No, that's the first line in your paragraph. Right. What's your sentence? Okay. It is vital for the classroom teacher to look beyond stereotypes without making assumptions. Appreciate each student. Or her or him for the individual they are. Right, and that, right, and that's back to the original uh, one of the earlier points of tolerance, right? Which is something when you're tired, you're overworked, you're stressed because you're trying to meet your curriculum deliveries and so on. 
You might not be the most tolerant. Nobody's saying you have to be tolerant 24-7 every day, but you have to try your best, right? To remember that being tolerant is important because when you model that for the students, they learn it from you, okay? So that's, let me see if there are any things that I underlined that you all did not choose. You actually, a lot of you chose things that I underlined, which is, which is interesting. So I, I also underlined this one, and I'll end with this one, on this article. A teacher's responsibility, and it speaks to something that was mentioned in Bermuda. A teacher's responsibility to adapt practices to, ma this is the second page, the third paragraph from the bottom. To maximize the benefit of marginalized students does not end in the classroom. Active collaboration with parents and their communities must be facilitated in order to identify potential barriers and solutions. So you cannot teach the students without getting to know the parents. If the parents are not coming to you, you have to figure out a way to go to them, to show them that you're interested in their child and to tell them that you want their help. That link between home and school is a vital link. To learn more about their background. And to learn more about their background. So you have a better understanding of where they're coming from. And you can help them chart where they want to go. See, I said where they want to go. So there's an element of human agency in that. Where they want to go. You may not be able to get them there, but you can help them to envision different opportunities just like that teacher did in the movie. Right? Okay, so the last section of the class, it's all about self-esteem. And it's, you know, you might be teaching math or whatever, but you're also building every day. You have opportunities to build their self-esteem, like the lady in the TEDx talk talked about, with the plus two, right? The next and last activity for today, before we wrap up and, and kind of wind up with what are the ways that teachers can positively affect the social context of their classroom is the discussion questions that I had emailed out. Does everybody have a copy printed out somewhere in front of them? In their room? In their, in their class? Yes, Jamaica, yes, Bermuda, you have the copy that I handed, that I sent? Dominica, you have it? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, St. Lucia, you have it? Yes. And Montego Bay, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you just have to listen, Montego Bay. Turn off the mic. All right, Vernon, do you know what I'm talking about? Can you hear? Can I hear him? No, he left. He left. Okay, well we'll come back. All right, now we're gonna play a math game to pick which one you're gonna do. Watch me in Jamaica. Here we go. You all are one group. Pick a number between one to ten, quickly. This Seven. Is, no, I'm sorry. Let's start again. Pick a number. Don't tell me the number. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, we choose that. Yeah. Let only one of you can play. Play on behalf of your team. Alyssa, I got it. you got your number. Double it. Add ten. Divided by two. Subtract the number you first started out with. Five. Yes. Right. Yours is number five. I know. I'm so brilliant. I'll teach you that trick after. Five. Let's go. We're going to do it again. Who's the spokesperson? Maybe if you know this trick, you can't play. I know the trick. Okay. okay. All right, David, do you know the trick? All right, let's go. Pick a number. Don't tell me. Hold on. Hold on. You did ten. Five. You did. Yeah, your number was five. Go ahead, David. Uh, pick your number, got it? Double it. Add 14. Divide by 2. Subtract the number you first started out with. Your answer is 7. Right. Your question is number 7. Ashley, your question. Pick the number. Double Add 12. Divide by two. Subtract the number you first You're going to join them. All right, you guys, what you're going to do is now you're going to, as it says on the paper, 
You have number five. Read number five. Agree, disagree, and tell me why, why not. You all start. Bermuda, are you ready? Bermuda, are you ready? Yes. Pick a number. Who's your person? Any of you? Just listen. Pick a number. Don't tell me what it is. I don't care. Between one and ten. Don't tell me what it is. Multiply by two. Double it. Add eight. Divide by two. And subtract the number you started out with. Your answer should be four. You have question four. Off you go, Bermuda. Dominica. Ready? Ready, Dominica? Yes. Pick a number. Don't tell me. Double it. Add 18. Pick a number between 1 and 10. You got okay. It. Don't tell me what it is. Double it. Multiply that number by 2. You got that? Yes. Add 18. Okay. Divided by 2. Subtract, okay. the, subtract the number you first started out with. Okay. Your answer is 9. You have number 9 on the question. Sheet. Yes. Yes, I know. Okay, St. Lucia. We're going to do two questions with St. Lucia. <laughs> Ready? All right. So, so one half of the group. You want me to do one question for you or two? Question nine. Okay. No, no, that's Dominica. You should have the sheet. You're doing question nine. Nine. Question nine. Um, mute your microphone. Saint Lucia, you ready? Yeah. All right, you pick your number between 1 and 10. You got it? Double it. Add 6. Divide by 2 and subtract the number you first started out with. Your answer should be 3. Right, so your question is number three that you're going to discuss. All right, off you go. So you're gonna just you're gonna read the question, everybody, and you're going to discuss it in relation to what we've been talking about today. You're gonna to agree with it, disagree with it, and tell us why. And you can refer to the reading, you can refer to the discussion. All right, which one you guys got? So yours is pretty straightforward. You're either going to agree or I kind of He's back. He had to. Wait, is that is that somebody who's taking the class, or is that somebody who's working? In I have no idea because they're never here. But there's, I, yeah, but he can't do anything anyway at this point because he didn't get anything, so he can't really.
adopted by a, a middle class lady whose name I'm forgetting at the moment and she it, it's told from different perspectives and there are chapters in the book that deal with Dexter's perception of his schooling and how he's treated at school and this is from one of those chapters 
And then also, so each chapter is written either in Dexter's voice or the voice of the woman who involved herself with the family. So from Jamaica's perspective, it's a social commentary on, on the society, the lack of interaction between different socioeconomic groups, as well as the disparity in the education system. It's a very easy book to read. It's a very compelling book. And I would have had you all read it because it makes for good discussion, but the people in the other islands would not be able to access the book, and you'd have to pay for it. And so I've mixed that idea. So we're moving on. This is an excerpt from that book. And this is Dexter's words. I'm going to ask one of your colleagues, one of your peers, to read it, and then just tell what they discuss. Which one of you is reading? Alyssa, Alyssa, or Dino? Loudly, please. Harry Potter. It says here, this education thing is like a race on sports day, with all the other runners one whole lap ahead. Them running on grass track while you run on stone. You run and run till your heart on bus but you will never catch them other runners, even though they don't run as fast as you and they're not so strong. They're just too far ahead and the score on their foot too sharp. Okay, so they're going to discuss that in relation to what we've been talking about today. That was number five. All over to you all. Um, Loudly. So no, no, that this is Dexter's voice because we didn't know that before. It says by Dexter. But I didn't, I didn't tell you. That's okay. Never mind. All right. So it seems like this, this person, he is in a schooling system with persons who are ahead of him for some reason. And we assume that it was because of socioeconomic reasons because um, it says, you know, they're running on a grass track while you're running on, on stone. So it seems like they have things much easier. Maybe these are students that, you know, they don't have anything to think about besides going to school. Yeah, they're, they're living their lives as children. Whereas Dexter, he says he's running on stone, meaning he has all these other challenges that he's dealing with. You know, it's much harder for him. And it's, it seems like he works hard, yeah, because it says they're not so fast as you and they're not so strong. He works hard, but always it seems like they are ahead of him just because they were born with this privilege that he doesn't have. So he has to try much harder to not even measure up. Correct. Um, I saw one thing in it. I saw one thing that was, look, that just popped up. Like, you have some teachers who they'll categorize children and they'll, you know, when they start to there's a word for it, but I, I can't think of the word. You know, when they'll, they'll, they'll treat other kids a lot better, like, you know, with that discriminating attitude where they'll treat out some students a lot better than the rest. They're like, okay, they'll just assume that's the right set and that's the don't set, you know? And then when they do that, yeah, you know, like, they're labeling. And I'm saying, okay, when you do that, and there's a child there who is just really trying and really trying, that child would probably have their hands up in class all, all the time, just always trying, but you're not paying any attention to them. Or the boys, per se, you're paying so much attention to the girl, and the boys are probably trying so hard, so they're like, okay, we're just always trying, trying, trying. So I'm like, that's basically a hard step for them, so that's a stone, because they're trying, and they're running to them hard on bus, but they just can't get the privilege of it. Yes, and then if it's compounded by the fact, in the case of Dexter, Dexter is from an inner city area, and because this middle class lady sort of adopts the family, she gets them moved to a prep school, which is a private school, and they have to take like three buses to get there. And by the time they get there, their uniforms are all sweaty. And he's carrying his little sister and his younger brother. So he has the responsibilities of the younger children. And whereas he's bright, his reading skills are not as strong as the other children because he missed many days of school because he didn't have lunch money to go to school when he was at the primary school. And so he's hesitant to speak to his teachers. And there's a lot of issues that, that teachers who teach in the inner city um, in Jamaica face, but also when he moves to the prep school, he did not have the great good fortune to find a Mrs. G who was going to be his champion. He did not have that great good fortune, and he had many other competing things happening to him outside of school between his mother, his mother struggled to survive and pay for the, the family, and then criminal elements that were trying to draw him into a gang. He's a teenage boy. Right, so whereas he has a sharp mind, the fire in that mind wasn't able to be lit and sustained because outside factors intervened. And although this person meant well, she couldn't, she couldn't save them because they didn't need saving. And that was part of the problem was that her approach was to try and save them. 
but her own life was now interfering with her marriage and her son and she just couldn't keep it up and the ball dropped and the whole idea was that perhaps they didn't need saving perhaps they just needed support to get to a certain level and then they could save themselves so it, it, it's a fictional work but it, it has a lot to say about Jamaica's education system so those of you who are interested I would suggest you read it you can buy it online I'm sure as well you get to pick the next number anyway go ahead and call out the number Number three. Number three. Who had number three? That's St. Lucia. Go for it. Number three is a quote. It is hypothesized that some students fail because learning, as presented by their teachers, does not make sense. Over to you, St. Lucia. <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon everyone, well, good evening. Um, well, most of us decided that um, we agree with the statement, right? Okay, and we said that indeed some students, some students would fail to learn by the way that the um, teacher presents because it might not be appealing to that particular student. So um, based on the fact that even Howard Gardner says that there are seven different um, intelligences, that people learn in different ways, okay, the seven different ways, it, it really has a bearing upon the way that that student perceives, you know, the world, the cultural context, all of these things take into consideration how they, how they view what the teacher is presenting in the way that the teacher is presenting it. So, you agree. So you, okay. agree, as a whole, you agree. So that that yes. that statement also takes into account because the social context of the classroom has to do with how teachers and students make sense of each other. That if there's a barrier to that understanding, then there's going to be a barrier to the connection that's needed for learning to take place. So, I agree. I agree. You all agree? Yes. Okay, yes. All right, so we're moving on. Thank you. You get to pick either the number four or six. Which number would you pick? Six. Six, over to number six. That's back in Jamaica. Okay, over here. Number six is? Teaching is not a neutral act. It is highly political, and issues such as race and class are always high teaching. Teachers should be mindful of how their actions can contribute to or stifle the development of a healthy identity and sense of and sense of self among students. Now my colleague here Ashley had a problem with always the word always as used in this in this um sentence scenario, right because she says there she doesn't believe that they're always high to teaching. But um, what we can say, what I can say about um, race and class is that um, it, in it all kinds of race issue in 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 all the way and context, but a class issue. Mm -hmm. And for example, we discussed that a student who 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 is chauffeur driven to school, as opposed to one who commutes by bus or taxi. Uh, the teachers normally pay greater attention. The, uh, better attention is usually placed uh, paid to those students in, in the classroom. That are chauffeur driven? Yes. Mm -hmm. If they arrive at school in a high motor vehicle, well, you know the, the teachers pay. It, 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 that's what are you making of your so, so we're speaking. No, no. Yeah, you can add, but hold on. I just want to point out that we know you're speaking in generalizations, right? These are, these are sweeping statements. And we're looking at overarching um, examples, right? So we're not saying that every teacher does that. That's not what we're saying. Right. We're saying that you're in your experience, you have seen teachers that do that. And it's not unknown to other people that it can happen. It doesn't always happen. But the, the, the important line in this paragraph is teaching is not a neutral act. Right, that's the, that line speaks to the power 
of teaching. The power inherent in the position as a teacher and even as a school. School is a power, school can be a powerful institution because you're shaping the minds of the future. And so it, with that power comes responsibility. That's one of the lessons of this, of this class is the link between school and society also has to do with power and changing that power balance, the structure. Are schools doing that or are they just feeding into the status quo? These are questions that people have, yes, some, that have, you ask generation after generation, right? So yes, some do, some don't. So the challenge is how do we get all to do it? Can we do that? Then you get into more philosophical discussions, right? So for me, why I chose this quote, and I only don't remember where these quotes come from, but I know that these quotes relate to the issues of race, class, gender, and culture, is that that line is very striking. That Teachers, I think, don't always remember the power and the responsibility that they have. Not only to teach the content of the subject, but because you're shaping the individuals in how you interact overtly, directly, and indirectly with them. Did you wanted to add something? Remind me of your name? Lauren. Lauren. I did. Oh, well, that's good. Okay, anybody else from your group want to add? You get to see. Well, the number is four. four. Number four. Who has number four? Bermuda. All right, Bermuda. Teachers and students from different ethnic groups bring to the classroom diverse cultural expectations about school what is to be accomplished and how it is to be done. Agree or disagree? Jason. You don't have an opinion on this? I can't hear you. We're interested in your opinion as a person. It doesn't have to be the Bermudian context, necessarily. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, good. Hold on. Jason, they're not saying anything right now. We're waiting for them. You want me to come back to you, Bermuda? All right, so we'll go, I'll pick, we'll go to number seven. Who has number seven? Back to Jamaica. Number seven is, go ahead. Teachers who refuse to monitor their own beliefs and classroom ethos can contribute to resistance on the part of students. All right, good night everybody, Zeta speaking. Um, we, again, we agree. Uh, we said that if you think of it from... I, stop, I, stop, stop. St. Lucia, can you hear Thalia? Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. Right. So um, we said if you look at the two extremes, if you have an uber hippie teacher who believes everything and everyone has their own opinion, after some time you will find that students are needing more structure, are needing a more strict approach because how come this teach everything is just love and everybody have opinion? No, and somebody must be right and somebody must be wrong. On the other end, if you have a teacher who's always promoting that if it worked for her and it worked for her grandmother, it must work for you. You must be quiet for the student and the teacher what I say is love. Sit down and write it, everybody just repeats right. it by rote. Eventually, students are going to start rebelling and say, why the teacher not involved in anything that we have to say, why we can't write something like that. And their rebellion so, might be just not to do their work. Exactly. It might not be like to they tear down the place. Official, right. you know, cool. right. And so we found that open-mindedness is really quite necessary um, in order to, to address that particular situation. Thank you. That is all. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. So that, that raises another issue that's part of the social context. Open-mindedness on the part of the teacher and the student. Thank you for that. We go back to Bermuda. Are you ready now? Yes, we all agree with this statement here. Are that that student? Number four. Sorry, number four. 
yes. teachers and students from teachers different, different right, teachers have different expectations and students have different expectations. And um, we all agree with it because we have the first thing we try to uh, like the first week of this in school term, we try to during the student, they're not really respect of them. So we keep them with the rules and uh, procedure that they go through the routine every day. But we expect them to learn and all of that good stuff there. And we turn also up to make them know who we are. One uh, trainer was saying that if we don't tell the student who we are, they're going to put this stuff up something about us and some of the ground with it. So we have to let them know who we are, where we get our training, what experience we have, and all of that. Because it's going to be, I know, and that will also help them because the child is not going to open up to a stranger. So if they start to know who you are and your background and all of that, they can identify with you. And more than you just go to the class and start to teach them and ask them to spend your with your children like that. But having to have a common point allows them to open up. Okay. So, and they are the Yes, that's well said. Yes, that speaks to expectations in general. So you lay down the classroom rules, what you expect from them academically, depending on what age group you're teaching, what you expect from them in terms of their behavior towards you and towards each other. But also, cultural expectations is the important line in this sentence. They have diverse cultural expectations about school. So the issue would also be to try and make connections of between the different cultures, if the teacher is from a different culture from the students, or in our case, an issue might be a different class from the students, right? And you want to try and bridge that gap. Like you gave a good example of a student who was singing in the class and you didn't want her singing. Didn't matter what she was singing, you just didn't want her singing. Yeah. It wasn't that you had anything against that song. Right. So that's something that you would explain to her, that no, it was not the time to sing, it didn't matter what you were singing. Thalia. Um, I was, point, when I was reading this, I was thinking to myself that um, in a country where you have persons from different cultures, obvious different cultures. Yes, it's very Each culture has a different approach and a different view on education that they've learned at home. For instance, uh, there's a student I have, her mother and I are friends, we talk together. She was born in this country, her parents are from India. Mm -hmm. And though they are Catholic, they have a lot of their cultural norms. And she's only in ninth grade, you would think at that point, yeah, you get to know you see us, have some playfulness. And I mentioned to her she was interested in other extracurricular activities, and her response as a sweet, adorable little Indian Jamaican girl was that, yes, but she feels that it's more important to get good grades, mm -hmm. and she has to to toe the line. And I know in some households, it is more important that you're getting 90s and 100s. You're more likely to get asked questions. Well, how come you only got 88? Why wasn't mm -hmm. it a 94? Yes. Then it's important for you to be involved in everything because from very young you know that you need to have a rounded personality. It's a different perspective. A different perspective. Right, and that is somewhat cultural. So you're right. I mean, and in, and in school districts in the U.S., for example, where you would have students from different cultural backgrounds where they speak different languages, they have to be they have to be communicating to the parents in the multiple languages. So they can't send everything home in English because the parents might not be able to speak English and then they can't read and then your that line of communication is broken down. So some schools have to have interpreters who will change you know, who will translate their, their notices into Spanish, into Mandarin, into Vietnamese, into uh, Hindu, right? Into whatever it might be that are all in their school system. Right? Then there are different religious beliefs that you have to think of, and so there's different ways that they interact with adults, and they may not want you standing next to them, or they may, and those are things that you would only know if you visited their homes, or you got to know their parents, or the child was able to explain to you, or they don't celebrate, like the school system I taught that in the U.S., you couldn't celebrate any holidays, because if you weren't celebrating all holidays, you couldn't celebrate any holidays. So there was no, it was just called winter break, it was called spring break, it was not called Christmas break or Easter break. There were no gifts exchanged among anybody at any time. Because if it was a birthday, that's a different thing, and you bring cake or something to school, but certain people don't have cake as part of their celebration, so however they celebrate, you honor that. So that's a simple example. We take for granted, oh, Christmas, we celebrate Christmas, we're all praying in the morning. 
Some students don't be, or have a different religion, so they can't be participating. It's not that they're being rude, and that kind of thing. You have to op be open-minded, back to that phrase. All right, last but not least is number seven. Number nine, who has number nine? Dominico. Yes, Dominica. Yes. Raising risk, risk the unlabeling and teacher expectations reveal the teacher's preconceived notions about students and their academic potential frequently were influenced by race and consequently contributed to the silence of self-fulfilling pro prophecies wherein students question their own potential for academic success. Right? So did you yes, agree? We, yes, we, we agree to that. Okay. Because we notice that some teachers labeling students based on their preconceived because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. And students getting to know that we just affect how they relate and how they understand what the teacher is saying. And at the end of the day, they might just end up to be a failure because they can perceive that the, the teacher has a problem with the color of their skin. Right. And it goes back actually to the quote that you picked from the other article, of which I told you was related to symbolic violence. It goes right back around to that quote where expectations, where you, you internalize others' opinions of yourself and you can't seem to break out of that cycle and believe that you can do more. So again, it's back to expectations and the impact of expectations. So if you're looking at how teachers can positively impact the social context of their classroom, one of the most important things they can do is instill a sense of hope, right? I'm gonna email this to you. But one of the things they can do is instill a sense of hope, be aware of the cultural diversity or racial diversity or economic diversity, whichever diversity it might be that applies to you within your classroom, right? That's being open-minded and tolerant. You can incorporate students' interests in lesson planning and delivery, like we did that last week when we modeled the activity with the youth newspaper or online forum or whatever it was. You can be aware of their home backgrounds and any needs they might have. You can set and maintain smart expectations. I'm gonna email them to you. You can maintain positive, create and maintain positive contacts, connections with your parents. You teach critical thinking skills. Those are life lessons. You teach goal settings and you model hard work, a hard work ethic. And you teach students to function in the real world. So you're not giving them false, a false sense of hope. You're giving them concrete skills that they can draw on. Are there any other ideas that you have in relation to the social context of the classroom that I have not mentioned in that list? First and foremost, I put instill a sense of hope, which relates to being their champion. Right? Right, build self-esteem. Tolerance. Yep, self-esteem or modeling tolerance, you could say, right? Modeling and teaching tolerance, okay. Anything else? If I have done anything today, if I have done nothing more than open your mind to thinking about these issues, then I have accomplished my goal, right? Because this is the kind of thing, it's useful in the long term for teachers to have in their heads when they're teaching, when they're doing their lesson planning. It might make you change the way you do your assessments to be a little bit more uh, flexible and include a variety of activities. So if I have you thinking about what is the social context of my classroom, then I have achieved my goal for today. You have a question, yes. I have a question. Um, I know that not many schools are boarding schools, but what do you say about like students who are from like boarding schools when you see at the secondary level because I've seen it already where and I did a research too I went I went through a research where in the boarding schools but it was just for one specific year so I didn't use that to make a, 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 a conclusion 
Um, the boarding schools, like the students' performance in the same it was way better than students in, in the same sex, I mean, co educational. Right? right? Now, what I realized, and they were same sex schools. Now, what I realized was that I met with some students who were. Hold on, stop, stop, stop. You need to speak when others are listening to you. Um, Bermuda, St. Lucia, Dominica, can you hear what Dina is saying about the concept of boarding schools perhaps being a different model that's not being looked into as much as it should be? Can you hear her? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Right, go ahead. And I met with some, I met with some young guys who, they went to, to, to boarding school now. They would, they went to a model, basically, mm -hmm. and they would party, and you know, they would party, they would go out, they, they love their sports, they would take part in everything, and what I realized was that even though you have a party on, on like, Friday night, and we have an exam on Monday, they'll go to the party, the party may end up too, and they'll leave at 11, and they're like, hey, we have got to study this weekend, and I realized that drew something to my attention, that, you know, they are very well disciplined. When they have training for sports, when they have their, their football training, they're on time. When they have a certain tutorial, they're on time. And I was like, you know, when I spoke to most of them, they actually were boarding. And I'm like, discipline, they are very well disciplined. Well, I mean, that's a similar argument that you might have for the Army, right? The Army teaches good discipline. Not all boarding schools are like armies. That's not what I'm implying here. But no, I was saying from one experience that I had, and I was like, interesting. But, I mean, there has, there has been research that shows that boarding schools have positive effects. I saw research from Brazil that... Particularly single, single sex, all girls, all, girls, all boys. All boys. Obviously, there are schools where you can board, but the girls live in one area and the and boys, boys live in one area. Um, because then the school becomes more part of your family because you're living there. So the impact of the school becomes even greater. Now you're taking into account the school is not just playing the role of teacher, but the role of caregiver after school operator making sure that everything they're getting back and forth so yes i mean they do instill and they and they instill great connections to the school like they're very you know they have a bond with their school if, i mean sometimes it can be a bad a negative bond where they had a terrible experience and nobody helped them other times it can be a positive bond so i mean i haven't done a lot of research into boarding school uh, the impact of boarding school, but I know at one time from a policy level Jamaica was looking into increasing the number of, of boarding schools particularly for young boys for that for that reason similarly increasing access to um, Uniform groups to expanding the uniform groups like um, What do you call the thing that the, the cadets? Which would teach discipline and teamwork and showing up on time and doing what needs to be done Somebody wanted to say something before I wrap up. I don't know which country. Yes, I was going to say nothing. I'm trying to do that. The boarding school where you have more faithful results because when you study, like for example, one how to play football and all of that, that is the outside thing. But when they are in when they are in the dance or whatever, their next job is just to study. We are having a person in the home. Most of them are going to be over here. Some people are going to be Yes, and, and you have and you can have both the positive impact of having other people around you, your friends are all studying, so you're studying. You can have the flip side of that where your friends are not studying, so you're not studying. So you know, you have to find a balance. So boarding school doesn't work for everybody, but it, it, it works for some. So to wrap up for next week, I'm going to email you the notes from today, as well as I'm changing. I'm changing next week's. Listen, this is important. I'm changing next week's lecture because I have to travel the week of April the seventh, eighth, ninth. I won't. I'll be in New York. So, Dr. Mondo, who is going to do the guest lecture, will come on that day instead. And he's doing multiple intelligences and the arts. So next week will not be multiple intelligences and the arts. We will move up the bottom two. The, the April 1st and April 8th will move up in order to allow April 8th to be Dr. Mundell's lecture. I will revise the thing and send it out to you so that there's no confusion. But I'm just telling you. So that means the paper is still due on that day? The paper is still due. The paper is still due.
still due. I will be here next week. The paper is still due. There's no extension because I have to grade all of them. There's a lot of you. It's still due. Right. In Kingston, I would love it if you just bring it. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.